Hi, everyone. I am the director of Belly of the Beast, and it is my tremendous honor to welcome you all to this special conversation on institutionalized racism within our criminal justice system, healthcare and prison, modern day eugenics, reproductive injustice within communities of color, and how mass incarceration impacts the basic fundamental human right to family. I'd like to thank all of our partners who made tonight possible and give a special shout out to Michael Latt, Alice Quinlan, and the entire Red Owl team for making this event happen. For those who haven't yet had a chance to see the film, let's take a look at the trailer featuring the original song by Mary J. Blige, See What You've Done. There is a culture of secrecy in California. I have some fear. What kind of repercussions will I get for coming on and talking about this? I've always been a fighter, but it wasn't truly birth until I was in prison. He did a pelvic exam. He said I had a fibroid. I was told that I had cancer cells. When I came out, I felt like something was wrong. We were getting hundreds of letters about medical abuses every month. When was the first time a doctor told you that you may be missing your ovaries? No one ever told me that. I had been intentionally sterilized, and I had been lied to. The law prohibits sterilizing people in prison for the purpose of birth control, but they were doing it anyway. One of the challenges with this story is you ultimately have to get to intent. And then that's when the doctor said, well, that's cheaper than welfare. I was looking at these documents that was confirming as a black woman, my life wasn't shit. much intimidated by whom I was going up against. The state has admitted that they have done these illegal surgeries, but we don't actually know who they did them on. Women's become numbers. You don't get names. And that's what makes it easy to abuse them. Women in California being coercively sterilized is absolutely revolting. After all this pain, I'll never be the same. We have yet to get an apology. We have yet to be acknowledged. The state has to be made accountable. Cause some wounds never heal. Do you see what you've done? Belly the Beast was made in collaboration with and for people inside prison. So please share with your friends, family, and colleagues inside that the film will be rebroadcast on PBS's World Channel tomorrow at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. I'd now like to introduce our incredible moderator, Sabra Williams, who has received international acclaim for her work as an actor, host, and co-founder of the Actors Gang Prison Project, including being named by President Obama as a champion of change in 2016 and being honored with the British Empire Medal for Services to the Arts and Prison Reform by Queen Elizabeth in 2018. She's the co-founder of Creative Arts, a visiting lecturer at UCLA, and an adjunct professor at USC. Thank you so much for moderating tonight's conversation, Sabra. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Erica. Thank you for your incredible film. And thank you for this opportunity to talk to these women that I admire so much. And uh, I'm so excited to have a dialogue with. I want to just start by asking us all people who are watching as well. But you know, particularly because there are people in this panel who have lived experience of prison, um, to remember who's inside still and to take a breath one unified breath and send our love in there. Thank you. 
I'd also just like to acknowledge that I am currently living in what we call Los Angeles, which is the ancestral land of the Tongva people, and it is unceded territory, um, and I am living on it. So um, I'm a, as you heard, I'm an actor and an activist. I've been working inside prisons in California for 15 years. Uh, everything good that's happened in my life, everything I've learned in this last 15 years has come from people who are or were incarcerated. So I am super excited to have this conversation about this very important film. And I'm just gonna ask everybody to introduce themselves, how they would like to be introduced. Um, I'm gonna start with Angela. Um, Angela, maybe you can just uh, talk a little bit about your film and about yourself. Sure, my name is Angela Tucker. I am one of the producers of, of the film Belly of the Beast. Um, and I am based in New Orleans, which is the land of the Chitimacha peoples. Um, I uh, am a social issue filmmaker. I work in fiction and documentary, and I'm extremely excited to be a part of this conversation. Thank you, Angela. And April, would you mind introducing yourself, please? Hi, everybody. My name is April Grayson. Um, I want to pause as well for the people that are inside really quick before I even introduce myself, because there are people who participated in this movie and aided in getting the stories out who are still fighting for their freedom, who are lifers in LWAPs, life without the possibility of parole, still fighting for their freedom. So I just really wanna honor those voices first. Um, and my name is April Grayson. I work for the Young Women's Freedom Center. I'm the policy associate, as well as the organizer for the Sister Warrior Freedom Coalition. And I'm an ambassador for Represent Justice. I am a formerly incarcerated woman who served over 17 years in Central Valley, both of the prisons um, in Central Valley. Thank you, April. Jamila? Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I, my name is Jamila Lemieux. I am also in Los Angeles, the land of the Tonga people. Um, and I am a writer and cultural critic. I am but a humble servant and supporter and cheerleader for the phenomenal uh, women who are on this call. Nothing more, <laughs> just a writer. That's kind of everything, but thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jamila. And then uh, Sean. Hello, everybody. I am Sean Holmes. I work for ARC, Anti-Recidivism Coalition, and I am a life coach there. Um, I served 22 years off of a 16 to life sentence. Thank you so much. Um, and I just wanted to start by talking with Angela about your film. Um, having filmed inside prisons in California, I know it is no easy feat. It's very difficult to film inside prisons and you did it over quite a long period of time. So what was it like filming inside prison for Belly of the Beast? And what were the difficulties that you faced just being able to even do that? Well, I should give a little bit of background information, which is that um, the director of the film, Erica Cohn, met uh, Cynthia Chandler about 10 years ago uh, at, as part of Justice Now's Let Our Families, Let Our Families Have a Future program. And um, that was really the beginning of the work that Cynthia was doing with women inside prison. And Erica became a volunteer legal advocate. And when she learned about the forced sterilizations that were happening inside prisons, you know, she knew that a film needed to be made, but there was kind of a very long process. And in her legal advocacy work, it was really just um, meeting, meeting women inside, working with Cynthia, who was doing that work. Uh, and then ultimately meeting Kelly Dillon, who had been released. Um, and the film tells Kelly's story as well as the story of many women inside. And the way that we made this woman in, this film in collaboration was really through the relationships that both Erica and Cynthia had with people inside, constant visiting, being in communication through email, in, through in person, um, and you know even all the way down to when the film was almost done, checking in to see if people wanted to have their names in the film, um, letting them know, and then ultimately for the public television broadcast, letting them know when it was gonna be on. Um, there's a lot of, you know, reenactments actually in the film. We were not able to, you know, film kind of the 
artful um, shots of women in examin examining rooms and those kinds of things. So we actually had to use a prison in Utah. Um, and it was through Kelly who really helped consult on the film and other people they allowed us to really understand what a prison exam room looks like so we could recreate that for the film and really give the audience a, a as much as we can, the visceral feeling of what it's like to be inside. But, so it was through a lot of collaboration and a lot of conversations and interviews with people who had been um, released. Uh, so collaboration, but not so, I mean, but getting a camera inside prison, yes, you're correct, is extremely difficult. And we had to be very creative to tell the story that we wanted to tell. What kind of creative things did you have to do? Well, it, the re, I mean, the reenactments really were the things we had to do. We had to just um, uh, go through all of the archival footage. We used a lot of archival footage as well. And, um, and then it was also, we did audio interviews with women and those audio interviews are used in the film. Um, so you can't hear voices of women who are currently inside in the film as well. So uh, we had hoped one day to be able to get sit down interviews with them, but that just wasn't something that was possible. So the, the voices is how we Yes, them. I think people don't necessarily understand like, why is that so hard? You would think that oh, yeah. you, want, you want to go in and talk to people. So you should be able to go talk to people. After all, us taxpayers pay for these prisons. Well, I think we know that, you know, um, things are, a lot of things are hidden for a purpose and uh, they make it as hard as they possibly can for you to do the interview so that, you know, you're not really able to tell a truthful story to be quite blunt. And so we were very fortunate to be able to communicate with people both through Erica and Cynthia's access and through um, phone calls, emails, and that type of thing. But us just like picking up a camera and sitting, doing sit down interviews for a film that is really um, interrogating the California prison system was never gonna happen. <laughs> yes, and actually yesterday we reached the horrible landmark of the 200th death of co from COVID mm. of somebody who's incarcerated within California. At my organization, Creative Acts, every week we post how many people are infected, have died, and staff who also, as people yeah. who are incarcerated. So mm. yesterday was the 200th death in the invisibility of prison. And so I guess I wanted to ask April or Sean um, to talk a little bit, if you can, about the historic, because I don't think people know, the general public don't know, the historic hierarchy of care inside prison. You know, even now with, um, vaccinations even now like they started with the staff right <laughs> they started in vaccinating staff and now some of the more at risk people inside are being vaccinated but could you talk a little bit about that either either of you about the hierarchy of care that happens inside or lack of care john i'll defer to you you go first and then i shall talk after you're done if there's anything else that needs to be said sounds good to me um our healthcare system um, within the walls has been poor my whole entire time out. Um, it was very difficult to um, get the, the smallest things done. Um, just like if you have a toothache, it was hard to get that toothache taken care of. Um, it was even um, so bad to where they wouldn't even give you um, uh, fill in for your tooth, they would just pull out your tooth because they said um, that they don't do that within the walls. And so I'm one of I'm one of those people that got a tooth missing because of that. Um, other things like um, I've uh, I've I've experienced experienced it myself when I went in for um, going in there for certain things, and they would say it was something else that needed to be done. Um, because of the thing, many things that I have seen wrongly done uh, within our medical system, within the walls done, I did not, it made me leery about um, asking for help for anything. It made me just want to self-medicate, like use natural remedies and things of that nature. Um, things that I can remember from when I was at home. Um, just uh, like stuff like that, asking the older folks that I was in the walls with 
um, how do you care for this? Because I wanted to avoid um, our medical system. Um, and I think that goes for a lot of women there. Um, and it was always something with our um, African-American women that they always wanted to add some extra stuff into your fold and do something extra outside of the ordinary that is not sh or should not be done. Um, like these uh, hysterectomies that they have been giving people for over all of these years. Um, I have witnessed many women go through this, many. And so um, it's heart wrenching to hear these women go into the doctor and come back and say, I gotta go to the doctor. They telling me I got these cancer cells. And so it made me feel like, golly, if I have a, a, a stomach pain, which I've had one before, I did not go to the doctor because of it. And so it was the norm in there. It became the norm. Thank you. April, did you want to add anything? Um, I do. I, I want to use the word punitive because you don't think as medical as being a place where they act out punishment, um, but they use the medical mental health, they use any form of doctor as a form of punishment, they would withhold that from you. Um, it's funny when Sean was talking about the dentist, there was a time that I had a cavity for seven years and I kept put, getting pushed down to the bottom of the list because I would move from different yards. And whenever you move to a different yard, you lose your spot on that list. Well, miraculously, I ran into a doctor who was willing, a dentist who was willing to save my teeth. And she was willing to drill down and she was willing, but that's not common. And it brought me to tears because I was so grateful that I, she was willing to save my teeth because nobody else was getting their teeth saved. We all were getting our teeth pulled and we're 20 and 21 and 22 and 23 years old, just having to have our teeth pulled because nobody took the time, the care or the consideration to wanna ensure that when we came home, we would be able to have access at a decent, healthy, productive life. Um, and I too remember being on the yard and about 27 years old, wondering why is everybody in my circle getting a hysterectomy and fearful that if I went to the doctor that I would have to get a hysterectomy as well. And another thing about the sentences that we serve, like those are already forms of sterilization. When you give a young black woman 20 and 30 in life sentences, you have already sentenced them to be sterilized. So then on top of the sentence of sterilization, you then sterilize me at the same time. So it's very punitive. Um, and it's still punitive with under Clark Kelso, like we've seen under this federal receivership till today with, like you say, 200 deaths for COVID, like we haven't seen any reprieve from this medical system. Mm. I'm so sorry that both of you had to go through that and it's, completely unacceptable. As you were saying, you know, with the federal instruction to the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, when it came a few years ago was because the medical care was so terrible that the feds had to step in and demand a higher level of medical care. So they have built new medical buildings and hospitals inside uh, prisons and things because they've been forced to. Um, and there is some evidence that people who get incarcerated for a long period of time because of the food and the terrible medical care actually age 10 years older than people who have not been in that system. I mean, it has a physical effect on people who are incarcerated. Um, and Jamila, I just wanted to bring you in if you wanted to, because I know you have seen the film and you have opinions about the film. If you wanted to talk a little bit about from your opinion uh, from your point of view about the amazing film it's it's absolutely an amazing film and, and such an important work um because i mean for so many reasons but chief among them you know for the first i'm 36 for the first time in my lifetime uh there's a serious sustained public conversation about mass incarceration right like that's not even a phrase that people were using outside of certain circles 10 years ago and so that it's being seen as a problem that this many people are incarcerated and that incarceration is the problem as opposed to what are we going to do to make it that we have better people so we can stop putting them in jail right that we're focusing on uh prison as the problem 
but women particularly uh and of course if we're talking about incarcerated women we're talking about the largest uh population being uh black and brown and indigenous women are still so often left outside of the conversation you know and it, it's a history of violence against you know these bodies being taken for granted right and when we talk about slavery we so often talk about um you know, the, or, or Jim Crow, we talk about the violence of lynchings, but we don't talk about the violence of the rapes, right? That the women were first were forced to endure at the hands of um, their captors and later their employers. Uh, and so for, particularly at a moment in which black women's reproductive uh, traumas are starting to make news, right? That there is conversation about the black maternal health crisis. This has to be understood as part of that, right? That these numbers about uh, women who are not able to carry a pregnancy to term that they desire to carry to term uh, or, or that are unable to get pregnant, that includes uh, formerly incarcerated women, right? And, and many of whom have been the victim of medical violence, you know? That fibroids were used as an excuse to uh, perform, you know, other procedures on people, right? Whether they were real fibroids or not is so inherently violent because that is such a source of so much you know, malaise in our community, right? The part of the reason that fibroids are such a problem is because there's so little research into treating them, right? Or preventing them because we're the ones that are getting them, right? And so to think that someone could take advantage of that vulnerability to do further harm to somebody who's already being harmed by the system, um, it just really underscores how healthcare has long been punitive for black women uh, in this country and other vulnerable populations of women. So it, it, it's it's a very important film. And I, I hope that everyone who considered themselves to be uh, invested in ending or addressing mass incarceration sees it. That's so true, Jamila, thank you. Like this, one of the things that I was amazed about about prison and it's still astounding and outrageous to me is that the state owns your body. They actually own your body when you're incarcerated. You have no agency over your body. You don't get to choose like the basic things that we would think about like what to eat or what to wear or, and then down even to like, you can't even sexually pleasure yourself. It's actually against the rules in prison. You can actually get written up for that, let alone have a relationship with anybody, even if you're in for life without parole. And I don't think people understand that. And so when the state is mandated with, you know, they're responsible for your body, then they also have to be responsible for the care of your body, or they should also be responsible. This whole, you know, 200 people dying in the California prison system was entirely avoidable. It was avoidable if they'd have not transferred people, let's say hundreds of people without testing them to begin with. What, um, and then, you know, I would love to ask um, Sean and April again, like what services would you like to see made available, particularly to women of color who are the majority inside prison? In fact, working in girls prisons in two years, I only ever saw two white girls and I worked in two girls prisons over the course of two years. So, um, you know, what services do you think should be made available to women of color in particular, but women who are incarcerated? to allow them like this bodily autonomy and the freedom to make their own self well-informed personal decisions about their body and their reproductive health. What do you think? I think that um, the women who are incarcerated need access to great therapy. Mm -hmm. um, right now, like I, I, as I mentioned earlier, the mental health system is used as a punitive thing. And if you, let's say a person is a person serving a life sentence and they have to they seek out mental health care, that becomes a mark against them on their file going to board. It's something that they could be used against them. But I think that we need access to really good therapy because as Jamila mentioned, like we've experienced such sexual violence since the 1800s where like the father of gynecology was performing surgeries on black women without anesthesiology because it was said that we've experienced no pain. And so that's, an, and, and even when you think about the rape laws, like they, there was laws that said that a, a Caucasian man could not be convicted of rape against a black woman back in the slavery days. And so that is the history of America. And so here we are today after being lived through all that, 
in our DNA, like we still feel this, we still understand the, the impacts of this. And I think that we need intensive therapy that is not going to be used or held against us that will actually allow us freedom of thought, freedom of our emotions, being able to feel how I feel without somebody telling me that it's wrong when I'm angry because you have wronged me and you have harmed me. Um, as far as medical, medical services, I still struggle with the doctor to this day. So I have a hard time advocating for anything medical for CDCR, but I think that they need intensive therapy. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, even if you've been inside for a short amount of time, the trauma, because mostly people don't realize people who get incarcerated have already dealt with a lifetime of trauma and violence in the community and poverty because those are the communities that are targeted for incarceration. So they already come in with that. And without, like you're saying, the resources, the mental health resources in the community. Yeah. Did you want to add anything, Sean? I did. Um, I believe that um, one of the things like they should be holding like platforms such as this, where their needs are immediately met. I mean, I know, I know that can be difficult in there, but it, it's not hard to do. Um, there's many areas that they lack in. And so, and, and as far as uh, our race, um, that they can look and listen to people. And because if everybody's saying it clearly is going on, everybody is not say, telling a lie. Everybody's not telling a lie. And so I feel like if they just sit down with everybody and hear everybody's needs and act and not just say, okay, okay, well, we, we gonna do it. Or oh, we're thinking about it, we'll, we'll bring this uh, to the platform and we'll see what we can do. No, act, because this is real and lives are being uh, taken because of it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's hard when even the basics aren't taken care of. I know recently at CCWF, they had no electricity in some of the buildings and no soap. And I know they had no soap because my organization, Creative Acts, sent in thousands of bars of soap into CCWF because they didn't have soap in there. Even like the basics that could help prevent the spread of COVID. That's like, you know, we have to at least be able to meet those basics. Um, and Angela, I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about, you know, the genesis of the film, because I know, you know, prison, as we know, uh, comes directly from the original sin of 400 years ago of the Native American genocide and slavery in this country. Prison emerged directly out of or the way that we have prison, the punitive prison that we have, the punitive injustice system um, comes directly. I mean, it's a historical line. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I know that that is infused into your film and the mm -hmm. reasons that these things happen now. Well, um... One thing I, I wanted to just say to um, respond also to, to uh, something that April said is we have a reparations bill. Um, there's a petition for that that's on our website, bellyofthebeastfilm.com, um, because you know we are trying to get reparations in the state of California because there are many, you have to remember that there are many women who have been sterilized and they have no idea that they've been sterilized. Um, they've had tubal ligations happen and they, have no clue. Um, so that informing women and many other things is a part of that reparations uh, campaign. So I just wanted to tell people that they can uh, sign that on bellythebeastfilm.com. And there is, there's been a little more momentum around that. And we're really trying to use California as a model for other states because um, it's happened in North Carolina, it's happened in Virginia, and it should really happen all across the United States. So I just, it's, that's something that a lot this campaign is for for us. Um, it's interesting because, you know, I came on this film about four years ago and um, Erica was in kind of the beginning stages of it. Uh, she had met Kelly Dillon, whose story is featured in the film. And, um, you know, we were, was sorting out how to kind of tell a story that feels, um, both, you know, informative, but also um, leaves the audience feeling like there is some there's hope uh, at the end of the film, right? I mean, it's that's the thing about making a movie is you want the audience to feel like there's 
there's hope, there's something that they can do. Um, and, you know, kept, what was interesting about that was in trying to raise money for the film was it wasn't until the Center for Investigative Reporting uh, did their study that talked about the 1400 sterilizations that people actually believed that this was something that was worth participating in as a film. And there were people who were just kind of like, how many people has this happened to? Uh, and we all know if it's happened to one person, it's too many. But um, you have to, we had to kind of justify who was happening to and why. And, and, and you can read between the lines and know, well, this is something that's happening to women of color. It's not really that big of a deal. And then once uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting story happened, we started to, the, we started to get some more momentum around fundraising and then ultimately public television came on a few years later and you know we're showing on independent lens but that's just a window into how difficult it was for us to have people understand that this is something that is actually happening and that because it's happening to women inside prison we still want to make sure that change occurs and we want to figure out a way for it to not happen anymore um, and that was something that always struck me as I, you know, as we were having these conversations with funders. Um, so, you know, sterilizations, we know the forced sterilizations have been happening in the United States for a very, very long time. You can go back to the 60s and you have um, Fannie Lou Hamer, who, you know, talked about um, getting a uh, forced sterilization and then uh, hysterectomies were happening so much that were called Mississippi appendectomies. But to go even further back, um, you know, the Nazis came to, um, uh, to the US to learn um, their tactics. Like they learned from us. Uh, so this goes way, 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 way back. Uh, and a lot of change, a lot of systemic change has to occur in order for um, this to no longer happen. And um, so reparations is the beginning, but there's, I mean, the, the prison system we know is, is broken and ultimately, you know, needs, well, you know, you guys know. Uh, so <laughs> I'm speaking to the choir, you guys know. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it was a little, I went all over the place, but it, it yeah, this is, um, this is something that's been happening for a very, very long time. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I was just thinking Jamila, you know, your work in this space as a writer as well is that it's becoming more public that, you know, women are not believed, particularly women of color. And just hearing what you're saying, Angela, about having to have somebody else, you know, validate that this is happening before they're going to support the film. And it has to be an organization rather than listening to the voices of women who this has happened to, or women who witness this or, are, you know, are impacted by it. Um, I just wanted, Jamila, you know, you're working in this space, you know, if you had anything you wanted to add to that. Yeah, it's unfortunately, it, it's part of a long history of Black women not being trusted to be the authors of our own stories, right? For women of color not being trusted to be the foremost experts on their own experiences. So um, we're, we're not believed or, or heard in uh, most spaces, right? Unless we are in positions of leadership, unless we've done, and, and, and even then you require uh, black and brown women that have done some unlearning uh, of what they've been taught to believe, because if not, what do you get are black women led publications that would never cover something like this film, or that would never talk about this subject, you know, five or 10 years ago, and some of them are still dragging their feet to the table today, right? But, but some of the things that are, some of the very conservative attitudes that I, you know, know from the inside have driven a lot of the journalism around black women have been um, black women performing what they think is this idea of recasting us as human, right? So we don't wanna talk about the incarcerated population of black women. We don't wanna talk about black women living with HIV AIDS, right? We wanna talk about things that you know change the narrative, but we can change the narrative all we want. But the truth of our experiences in this country is certainly uh, more likely to, to resonate with what these sisters have shared on this call and, and what the women in that documentary share about their lives than what 
we would like to see portrayed on a sitcom, right? That makes us feel good about ourselves or, you know, in some uh, article about some black entrepreneur who's trying to buy back the block, right? And that's great. That's important work too, you know, arguably, uh, but it, but it, in our quest to feel good, to feel better about ourselves. And, and I get it, we need good news to get to keep going, right? If we're only looking at the, the, the most tragic parts of our ex experience, um, you know, it, it can be hard to see what comes next. But at the same time, I, I think too many of us forget that that tragedy defines most of our lives in some ways. So you can't see anything else, right? And there are people who don't have the privilege of simply just saying, I'm gonna turn the channel, I wanna read something else. So it's important that those of us that are in media and communications are insisting that these stories are present and that we, you know, can shift uh, the, the way that we talk about Black women in general and specifically Black women uh, who have been entangled in the criminal justice system because there's no group in our community, I think, that is more worthy of, of love and support and has been so vehemently denied that has been treated as if they're the you know the, the reason for their condition um and i think lacking in empathy with the limited empathy that we give to uh men who have been incarcerated that we still extend more to them i would argue than we do women because we expect more of black women right that we we're holding them to some sort of higher standard while neglecting the conditions that would funnel them into a system of mass incarceration so the media like every institution in this country uh, has to do better. That's so fascinating. Thank you for saying that. You know, I, I will add that, yes, these are difficult things. We're talking about like really a lot of trauma and struggle. And But I have to say over the past 15 years, the place that I get the most joy from is inside prison, is working with people inside prison. Because what they people on the outs don't see is that the, um, the joy and the transformation and the willingness to change and the willingness to self-reflect and the courage that people tend to have who are incarcerated because they haven't had access to the things that a lot of us take for granted. And when they have access to, let's say the arts and the work I do, they flourish. And you know, it's, to me, it's just like the greatest, the greatest joy and inspiration in my life. And I, I you know, thinking about that, Prison is another place where has been ripe for colonization. You know, a lot of people coming to work inside prison have not been doing their own self-reflective work that you need to do if you're working with impacted populations. And so I would just love to hear from, you know, April and Sean, like, how can people, What what is it that you need people to step up with? You know, how can people be a real ally and not, you know, be causing unintentionally causing more difficulties and trauma how can we this film is a good example of a good ally i think because it's telling a story it's a, centering the people who are most impacted and it's telling it with compassion and wisdom but how can we you know people want to do something so how can we be the best allies to you if you know or think or have opinions well, um i'm a currently a part of um, a coalition called the Sister Warrior Freedom Coalition. And we organize actions all the time. And what I notice is that we don't get a lot of people that show up to our actions. We had an action outside of Chowchilla um, in the midst of COVID and nobody showed up. We showed up for ourselves. Um, and then you see other prisons getting media attention and you know everybody's showing up for these male prisons but nobody's showing up for our prisons. And so, to show up. And then when you show up, don't take the front stage, show up and stand in the back because it's not about you. Um, oftentimes we see people show up and they want to say, oh, I'm here, but what are you actually doing? And like, when we do do, like we're working on legislation, like are you, if we if we send out a massive email for you to to, to talk to your, your local, your legislator, your assembly person, your senator, like send out that email, make these phone calls, show up because that's the only way we get stuff passed. They want to know what their constituents feel about these issues that we're raising. Um, of course, you can always donate. Like you can go on Represent Justice at any moment and find a click, a link, or something. You can donate. Do you can everybody. always Please do that. <laughs> you can always get access to a donation button. But at the same time, on Represent Justice, you can also get access to information and the different campaigns that we're working on. 
um, and how you can support these campaigns. So show up, donate, and don't show up in the front, show up in the back and, and support, hold up the women who have the courage like Kelly to stand up and fight a beast of a system that nobody's had the courage to fight. Stand in the back and hold Kelly up. That's how you can show up. Thank you. I agree, being active in the fight. I mean, this is a fight to end all this madness that is going on. And I believe if you lend a helping hand in all of these different organizations that are really trying to make it happen, then you're, you're, you're doing a lot for your community and for this population that is left behind because this is a left behind population. And so it takes a village. It takes a village to make it happen. And so what are we doing right now to make it happen? Thank you. And yeah, I mean, I I would just add, we have people like our new district attorney in LA, George Gascon, who is you know putting forward ideas like radically changing the system, which has come directly from people who have been incarcerated who have been at the you know sharp end of, of the so-called justice system. And then you know we fight so hard to get someone like that elected because we want this progressive change. And then when he gets attacked, nobody's there. Nobody's there, like what people are trying to recall him, but nobody that not nobody, there are few there are much fewer people stepping up to try to make sure that we are able to make this change. Because when you want to make radical change, you're gonna get massive blowback. Um and you know Angela, even, you know, with your film, I know that there are repercussions to be had. I experience in them myself, and I'm not even incarcerated, you know, when you speak out or when you shine a light in a place that people don't want a light shone. And so I'd just like to just ask you if you want to just finish with a, a little bit about, you know, how do we, um, how do we have the courage? How do we get the courage? to be allies in this space? And then also, you know, how do we deal with it when the return is like a pile of muck on our heads? <laughs> yeah, we were we were very concerned about retaliation happening to women inside, you know, because we had, you know, we had interviewed many women inside and we just wanted to make sure that the film doesn't sort of aid in that retaliation happening. And, and so far, you know, we've been in, in communication with folks and, um, you know, I, I think our diligence has been helpful, but, you know, we're, we're just trying to get as many women inside to see the film as possible. Um, and that's why we got this additional public television broadcast. You know, we, we showed in November and we really pushed to show again um, because we feel like the momentum is building and we want more and more people through seeing the film to really understand, you know, what is, ha what, ha what not just what happened to Kelly, but what is happening right now inside. Um, I, you know, for me, I think a lot about uh, when Kelly, in the beginning of the film, there's this deposition footage of her. She, it's, she's very, very young. And, um, you know, she's talking about, she's trying to talk about um, the violation that had occurred to her, the hysterectomy, all the details around that. But she's really being retried for the crime that she is in prison for. Um, with, and she has to kind of relive um, the domestic violence that she lived for, that lived through, that um, uh, meant that she had to, you know, have this altercation with her husband with her husband at the time, and so she was being just retried for what she was in prison for, and no one really cared about um, the violation of the hysterectomy. Uh, and when I look at that footage, and I just see her that young knowing that there are so many people like Kelly who are going through that right now. Um, that's really how I get the strength to kind of keep pushing forward and doing this work. And that's how many of us do. Um, in terms of, you know, the work that we're doing, it's really tied to the reparations movement and it's tied to, um, also supporting Kelly's organization, Back to the Basics. She's doing a lot of incredible work in LA. Um, and so you can learn more about her organization there. Um, and partnering with different organizations to see how the film can be utilized as a tool. I mean, just to speak to you know, um, something that April said about uh, when you come to an action, really staying in the back 
and um, being present, but it's not about you. That's how I feel about the film in a way. Like, I feel like we made this film, it's a tool. It's not about me, it's about the women inside. So how can we support the film and the movement with this tool that we provided? We know that we have, you know, we have the tool of the film and we have the tool of media. We know that media is very powerful um, and we'll just continue to use the tool so that the people in the front can just have it and we can support in whatever way that makes sense. Thank you, it's an incredible tool. I always say injustice in, activism out. That's mm -hmm. like the fuel. That's way to put that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to give Sean and April the last word as always. Um, if you, you know, you guys are both on the outs now, um, what would you say to our sisters inside who are deep in the belly of the beast? What would you say to encourage them, even if they are life without parole? What would you say that you've experienced since you've come home that could give them hope, either one of you, or both, I mean, both of you, I hope. <laughs> I wanna answer this question, but I wanna say something before I answer that question. Um, last night I was rewatching this movie and I was watching the part where Kelly was graduating from college and all the joy that she was able to experience. But it brought me to tears because we as black women are not allowed to have that type of joy. We don't have access to colleges and we don't have access to that. And she had to fight so hard after she had been sterilized, coming home from prison, having a regained relationship with her children after being criminalized for being a survivor of domestic abuse. To have this moment of such joy that she had to work so hard for. And I just, I want people to understand that women of color sh that don't, we shouldn't have to fight that hard. We shouldn't have to fight that hard for small things that like we shouldn't have to, we shouldn't have to struggle, 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 struggle when that's this people who have privilege have such access to these things. And so like, it was such a high moment to see it, but it also brought me such sadness because we have to fight so hard for everything we have. And I don't think people understand that. And so I just really wanted to say that. Um, as far as the people who are inside, like um, as I was watching the credits last night, again, I thought about Elizabeth Lozano and Michael Conception, people who went into the voices of making the voices that of these incarcerated people. Um, I just, they need to know that they're not left behind. Now we are writing legislation. Now we are pushing bills. Like right now, I'm currently working on a bill that's 11, that's an 1170D a thing that would add, um, we're trying to give, justice to people who are survivors of human trafficking, something that shouldn't be overlooked. And so, and that's a, a post-sentencing, we're working on pre-sentencing, but that's post-sentencing. So post-sentencing mean that people who are in there would be able to benefit from this bill because far too often we see our people are criminalized instead of being protected and helped. And so I just want them to know that we are advocating, we are fighting, like we are beating down these doors. Like we are not just sitting here saying, oh, I'm home and life is great. And I, my, my bills are paid and I have a nice car and I have a great life. And no, I wake up every morning knowing of where I was and that they're still there. I cannot forget that they're still there. Um, and that when they do come home, technology will kick their asses. <laughs> But don't oh, quit. Well, this creative acts will come in and do our virtual reality program and prepare them to come home. <laughs> Technology <laughs> will beat them up, but do not quit. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean, did you want to say anything? To yes, people? I just want them to know that we are really, really out here doing it for them. We are out here being advocates because that was my life for so many years and I will never, ever forget about it. And so I want them to know that we are always going to be there and that they will never be left behind. As long as I'm in living, they will never be left behind. And that I work for an awesome organization that works on prison reform. And so I am going to always be there. Even, and I might, even, I may even change a job or whatever the case may be. I am always going to be there for my people because those are still my people and I won't stop until it is done, until it is signed, sealed and delivered. Thank you. It's interesting, that's one of the, I remember we were just working in Juvie before the election doing uh, our civic engagement program. And that was one of the things that they just blew their minds. They were like, what do you mean people are out there working for us? They know about us, they care about us. 
they're fighting for us it just blew their minds and gave them so much courage and hope so thank you Angela thank you for your incredible beautiful film thank you Jamila for sharing and your writing you know your your um, vision for what the media can do in the space thank you so much for that and Sean and April you know my thanks doesn't really mean anything but you know just knowing the ladies of the side so well and just knowing your hearts and you I know it can be re-triggering to think about that time but I'm just so grateful for, for you and I hope that after this you go and do something nice for yourself have a bath or have something nice to drink or make a nice meal because you know these things can have an impact on you so thank you so so much everybody Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.